Hey there, welcome to this online lecture series. This lecture will cover the important concepts of the cell. This lesson will be focused on the cell and its components and their functions. We will focus on microscopy, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes, the internal organelles including the endomembrane system, the cytoskeleton components, and extracellular components and connections. After this lesson, you will be able to compare and contrast the structure and function of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, describe, model, or draw the structure and functions of the major cell features of both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, describe relevant differences among eukaryotic cell types and prokaryotic cell types, and describe fundamentals of the endosymbiont theory as it relates to eukaryotic cell evolution. So this is an important lecture. We learned in the first lecture that the fundamental unit of life is the cell. Everything else below this level of hierarchy is not considered to be alive or have life, making the cell the simplest collection of matter that can be alive. The cell is where all the magic happens, and every living organism is made of either one or many cells. The average human body contains 30 trillion cells. We start out as just one cell, which is then replicated through mitotic cell division and leads to the trillions of cells that make us. Therefore, all cells are related by their descent from earlier cells. These trillions of cells can differ substantially from one another, yet share common features. Can you think of types of cells that make up your body? We have so many, but just to name a few, myocytes, hepatocytes in the liver, cardiomyocytes, osteocytes in the bone, neurocytes, melanocytes in the skin, erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells, and enterocytes in the gut. Of course, cells are usually too small to be seen by the naked eye. So, biologists use microscopes and other tools of biochemistry to study them. There are a few different types of microscopes you need to know. The first is a light microscope, which is abbreviated as capital L, capital M. Any microscope you've ever seen or used in person is most likely a light microscope and looked something like the microscope pictured here. It's called a light microscope because visible light is what's used to visualize your specimen. Inside the microscopes, there are special glass lenses which the light is passed through. Think of these lenses just like eyeglass lenses. The purpose of lenses is to refract or bend the light so that the image is magnified just like a magnifying glass does. Microscopes tend to have at least two lenses in them to help magnify the cells, which makes them compound light microscopes. When we're discussing microscopy, there are three different important parameters to note, magnification, resolution, and contrast. Magnification is the ratio of an object's image size compared to its real size. For example, if a cell is one micrometer and we see it under the microscope as 10 micrometers, this magnification is 10x or we magnified it 10 times. Resolution is the measure of the clarity of the image or the minimum distance of two distinguishable points. For example, if I place two dots near each other, you can probably the distinguish them clearly. They have a high resolution, but if I make the dots smaller and closer together, that resolution will decrease as it becomes less clear. Contrast is visible differences in brightness between parts of the sample, and you probably know this one if you've ever tinkered with the contrast settings of a digital photo. 
Lighter images are easier to see on darker backgrounds. Bright light microscopes contain a condenser with an adjustable aperture to control the contrast. In the near future, I will be making a video detailing the parts of the microscope and the computations you'll need when using one. All of the different types of microscopes have differing capabilities. Light microscopes can magnify effectively to about a thousand times the actual size of the specimen. We can further increase the visibility of the specimen by using different lab techniques, such as enabling cell components to be stained or labeled. This may greatly increase contrast under the microscope. For example, there are gram stains, which are used to distinguish different species of bacteria. Gram positive is purple and gram negative is pink. Light microscopes also allow for viewing live specimens. For example, you can go collect some pond water and make a wet slide and you'd be able to see some microscopic life swimming around underneath your microscope. However, the resolution of standard light microscopy is too low to study organelles, which are the membrane enclosed structures that are inside of eukaryotic cells. This is a chart comparing the visualizing capabilities of the naked eye, light microscopes, and electron microscopes. The naked eye can observe specimens above 100 micrometers. Light microscopes can observe a range of 100 nanometers to 100 micrometers, while electron microscopes are required to observe the smallest range of a specimen of 0.1 nanometers to around 10 micrometers. So let's look at these highly capable electron microscopes. Electron microscopes use electrons to visualize the specimen, and this is in contrast to the light microscope, which used visible light to view the specimen. We have two basic types of electron microscopes, or EMs, to help us study subcellular structures, which are structures that are smaller than and within the cell. They are scanning electron microscopes and transmission electron microscopes. Scanning electron microscopes, or SEMs, focus a beam of electrons onto the surface of a specimen to visualize it, and this provides images that look 3D. Transmission electron microscopes, or TEMs, focus that beam of electrons through a specimen, and this allows TEMs to study the internal structure of those cells. I want to reiterate that electron microscopes are very powerful tools for visualizing cells, tissues, and small organisms in very great detail. The samples have to undergo a complex preparation process to help them withstand the environment inside the microscope. That very high energy electron beam directed at the sample coupled with the high temperatures and the vacuum that's inside the microscope kills the tissues and cells. Therefore, no live specimens can be visualized with an electron microscope. Before we get into the components of cells, let's first revisit something first mentioned back in lecture one. The basic structural and functional unit of every organism is one of two main types of cells, prokaryotic or eukaryotic. It's very simple. Eukaryotic cells have organelles and prokaryotic cells do not. We also learned the three domains of life in lecture one, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Organisms of the domains bacteria and archaea consist of prokaryotic cells. Organisms in the domain eukarya consist of eukaryotic cells. Within the domain eukarya, there are kingdoms, protists, fungi, 
animals, and plants, which all consist of eukaryotic cells. While eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells differ in a big way, there are basic features that all cells have in common. All cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane. All cells have a semifluid substance called cytosol. All cells have DNA in the form of chromosomes, which carry genes, and all cells have ribosomes, which are what make our proteins. So let's look into prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells a little deeper. Prokaryotic cells are characterized by having no nucleus, so instead the DNA is in a region unbound by membranes called the nucleoid region. Prokaryotes also lack any other membrane-bound organelles, and the insides of their cells have a substance called cytoplasm bound by the outer plasma membrane. Note that cytosol is different from cytoplasm. The cytosol is the intracellular fluid, the liquid or aqueous substance that all chemical reactions and cell components are suspended in. The cytoplasm is the term for all of the contents that we find within the cell membrane, and this includes the cytosol, organelles, lipid droplets, starch granules, and mineral crystals present inside the cell. So cytosol is a component of cytoplasm, but they are not the same. One thing not included in cytoplasm is the nucleus. Eukaryotic cells are characterized by having DNA in a nucleus, which is bounded by a double membrane. Membrane-bound organelles, which we will learn about in this lecture, and cytoplasm in the region between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. One thing to note is that eukaryotic cells are generally much larger than prokaryotic cells. Let's go back in time a couple billion years. The Earth was formed around 4.6 billion years ago, and the first cells formed about a billion years later. These first cells were the early forms of prokaryotic life, simple cells with no organelles and not very large. Fast forward another billion years or so, and we see the emergence of eukaryotic life, more complex, larger cells which work together to create multicellular organisms. Surrounding every single cell is the plasma membrane, a very, very important part of the cell. This is not any ordinary barrier. This is a selective barrier that allows sufficient passage of things that are necessary for that cell to live, like oxygen and nutrients and waste, into and out of every cell. Always remember, your cells are the first level of life. Life requires a steady state of internal, physical, and chemical conditions that we call homeostasis. The plasma membrane is the doorway into and out of your cell, and therefore it's very important that it is able to be selective in what's allowed in and out. In the last chapter, we learned about the four macromolecules, one of which is lipids. One special lipid we learned is called a phospholipid, which contains a hydrophilic water-loving head and a hydrophobic water-fearing tail. Phospholipids in water rearrange themselves into a bilayer, whereby the hydrophilic heads are in contact with fluids of your body, and the hydrophobic tails are inside the bilayer, only in contact with themselves. Another term for the plasma membrane is the phospholipid bilayer, and we'll return to this in the next lecture. As stated, an important way that the plasma membrane supports homeostasis of a cell is by making sure that the proper amount of oxygen and nutrients are passed into that cell. Cells have certain metabolic requirements which set upper limits on the size of cells. 
Another way of saying this is larger cells require more food, and food gets in through the plasma membrane, which accounts for the cell's surface area. So the surface area to volume ratio of a cell is critical. In the first cube, we see that the surface area is six centimeters squared, while the volume is one cubic centimeter. The surface area to volume ratio is then six. Next, we have a cube with a surface area of 150 centimeters squared, a volume of 125 cubic centimeters, and a surface area to volume ratio of 1.2. As a cell increases in size, its volume grows proportionately more than its surface area. Notice how the ratio decreased as we increased the size of that cube. This ratio of 1.2 might not be sufficient to allow the proper amounts of oxygen and nutrients to serve this larger cell. So how can we fix this? We need to add more surface area. The final cube now has a surface area of 750 centimeters squared, a volume of 125 cubic centimeters, and a surface area to volume ratio of six again. As a quick real life example of this, cells that line your stomach are called enterocytes, and they have special projections called microvilli, which mimic little fingers. These are adaptations of the cell that allow more surface area and therefore more absorption of nutrients in your gut from the food that you eat. For the rest of the lecture, we'll be focusing on eukaryotic cells. Here's a view of two eukaryotic cells, a plant cell and an animal cell. So once again, all eukaryotic cells have internal membranes, that divide the cell into compartments called organelles. Biological membranes are a double layer of phospholipids and other lipids. A quick comparison and you'll see plant and animal cells have most of the same organelles with a few exceptions. Can you spot a couple of these differences? Notice how plant cells have chloroplasts, a large central vacuole, and a cell wall, while animal cells may have a flagellum or cilium and are surrounded only by a plasma membrane. I'll point these differences out and more as we get to them in this lesson. We're going to begin with the most important organelle, the nucleus. The nucleus is important because it houses a eukaryotic cell's genetic instructions. We're talking, of course, about the DNA. The nucleus contains most of the cell's genes, not all, and is usually the largest and most easily recognizable organelle. We call the membrane that encloses the nucleus the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope separates the inside of the nucleus from the cytoplasm. One thing to note about the nuclear envelope is that it's a double membrane. Each of the membranes consists of a phospholipid bilayer. And this makes sense, right? It houses that precious genetic material, so it has two membranes to protect it. If we examine this nuclear envelope closer, we see that it's covered with flower-looking structures. These are pores, lined with a structure called a pore complex. The pore complexes are the entryways for molecules to get into and out of the nucleus, and those are also highly selective. The nuclear side of the envelope is lined with the nuclear lamina, which is a scaffolding composed of proteins and maintains the shape of the nucleus. The nucleolus is located within the nucleus and is the site of ribosomal RNA, or also called rRNA, synthesis. Remember, RNA and DNA are both types of nucleic acids. There are a few important types of RNA that we'll learn through this lecture series. rRNA is a special type of RNA that forms ribosomes.
In the nucleus, DNA is organized into discrete units called chromosomes, and each chromosome contains one DNA molecule attached to proteins that are called histones. When DNA is wrapped with histones, it has a special name called chromatin. Chromatin condenses during mitosis and meiosis to form discrete chromosomes as a cell prepares to divide. These images of mitosis show how condensed that DNA strand becomes for prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, and anaphase. And this helps to protect the DNA from entanglement while it's moving across the cell. Next is ribosomes. Ribosomes are the cell's protein factories. A very, very important job. Remember, 50% of the dry mass of a cell is protein. Proteins have so many roles in the body. They act as enzymes, hormones, structure, movement, and antibodies, just to name a few of their jobs. And ribosomes are the structures that build all of those proteins. Ribosomes are complexes that are made of rRNA or ribosomal RNA and protein. We find ribosomes present in two locations. They're either freely floating around in the cytosol, and we call these free ribosomes, or they're bound to the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum or the nuclear envelope, and we call these bound ribosomes. Ribosomes are made of two subunits, one larger and one smaller. And here's one really important thing that I want you to note down. Question, are ribosomes organelles? Are they surrounded by a membrane? No, no, ribosomes are not organelles. So, do prokaryotes or eukaryotes have ribosomes? Both of them. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have ribosomes. Ribosomes are what will be synthesizing the proteins in all living cells. Take a minute to check your understanding and retention. Match the term in the left column to the correct answer in the right column. Pause the video, then play to check your answers. Next, we are moving on to the endomembrane system. This system contains a number of organelles that are central in the process of creating and exporting proteins. Together, the components of the endomembrane system regulate protein traffic and perform metabolic functions in your cells. The endomembrane system consists of the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, and the plasma membrane. Note that these components are either continuous, meaning they're physically connected, or they're connected by transfer vesicles, which shuttle products from one organelle to another. We've already covered the nuclear envelope, so we'll begin with the endoplasmic reticulum, which serves as the biosynthetic factory. Biosynthetic means the formation of chemical compounds by a living organism. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, accounts for more than half of the total membrane in many eukaryotic cells. In the image, you'll notice the ER membrane is continuous with the nuclear envelope. There are two distinct regions of ER. Smooth ER, which lacks ribosomes, and rough ER, whose surface is studded with ribosomes, giving it a rough appearance. In the TEM images, we can see smooth ER on the top with no ribosomes, while the bottom image contains ER with small dark dots all over, and these are the ribosomes of the rough ER. 
But the two types of ER don't just differ in structure, they also have very different functions that you must know. We'll start with the smooth ER. The smooth ER synthesizes lipids such as steroid hormones, metabolizes carbohydrates, detoxifies drugs and poisons, and stores calcium ions. Different types of cells contain different ratios of the two types of ER depending on the activities of that cell. For example, we find an abundance of smooth ER in liver and gonad cells because the liver is crucial in detoxification and gonads produce steroid hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. Muscle cells have a specialized form of smooth ER that stores calcium ions, which is a necessary participant in muscle contraction. Conversely, the rough ER has those bound ribosomes, which secrete glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are proteins covalently bonded to carbohydrates, we can tell by the prefix glyco, which means sugar, and is used to inform us of glucose and its derivatives. The rough ER also distributes transport vesicles, which are secretory proteins surrounded by membranes. Secretion simply means to discharge or release, and when it's used in cellular biology, this means that something the cell will release outside of itself to the extracellular matrix or another cell or into the bloodstream. And finally, the rough ER is a membrane factory for the cell. Next up is the Golgi apparatus, which is dubbed the shipping and receiving center of the cell. The Golgi apparatus is usually smaller than the ER and consists of those flattened membranous sacs called cisternae. Transport vesicles from the ER are received at the cis face of the Golgi, where they fuse with the Golgi and deliver their cargo. Within the Golgi cisternae, there's an assortment of specific enzymes that are anchored into the membranes, and this allows for a highly organized, progressive processing of that cargo through the Golgi. Here the Golgi modifies products of the ER and most of that processing is post-translational modification of proteins. Translation is the term to describe the process of ribosomes using mRNA to make proteins. So post-translation means after we've made the protein it's going to be modified. That's a post-translational modification. An example of post-translational modification of proteins is phosphorylating something. The Golgi also manufactures certain macromolecules and it sorts everything, packages the materials, and packages them into transport vesicles and releases them out of the trans side, the trans face of the Golgi, either for secretion or to be sent somewhere within the cell. Next are the lysosomes, recognized as the digestive compartments of the cell. To lyse means to destroy and break apart, and som comes from the Greek soma, meaning body. A lysosome is a membranous sac of hydrolytic enzymes that can digest large macromolecules. Hydrolytic means that the enzyme uses water to help break molecules apart. And this is enzymatic digestion, just like what happens in your stomach. Lysosomal enzymes work best in an acidic environment inside the lysosome. Now there are two major uses in the cell for lysosomes. And remember, lysosomes simply break things down via enzymatic digestion. The first use for lysosomes is after a process known as 
phagocytosis. Some types of cells in our body can engulf another cell by phagocytosis. Phagocytosis literally means to eat the cell. And an example is a type of immune cell called a macrophage whose main role is to phagocytize bacteria and damaged tissue. We see this pictured here. Engulfing the bacteria or the solid particles from the damaged tissue forms a food vacuole in the cell. The lysosome then fuses with the food vacuole and digests those molecules within. Phagocytosis is one form of endocytosis, which will be covered in depth in Lecture 7. The second major use for lysosomes is to recycle the cell's own organelles and macromolecules, which may be damaged or old, and this process is called autophagy, which means to eat the self. So let's discuss vacuoles since you've been introduced to food vacuoles. Vacuoles are diverse maintenance compartments within the cell. Vacuoles are essentially large vesicles derived from the ER and Golgi that hold cargo. They perform a variety of functions in different kinds of cells. As we saw, food vacuoles are formed by phagocytosis. Contractile vacuoles are found in many freshwater protists and pump excess water out of cells. This helps those protists to maintain their buoyancy. Central vacuoles are found in many mature plant cells and they function to hold organic compounds and water. And there you have it, the endomembrane system, a complex and dynamic player in the cell's compartmental organization composed of different membranes suspended in the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell. The membranes divide the cell into structural organelles which carry out the cell's functions. Next, we'll focus on the energy organelles in the cell, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts function by changing one form of energy into another. Mitochondria are the sites of cellular respiration, while chloroplasts found in plants and algae are the sites of photosynthesis. While they may look very different at first, they have more in common than you might think. We'll briefly talk about them in this lecture, but there are additional in-depth lectures for each of these organelles. The mitochondria utilize chemical energy conversion and are often called the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria are found in nearly all eukaryotic cells, but an example of cells that lack mitochondria are actually your red blood cells. Mitochondria have a smooth outer membrane and an inner membrane folded into cristae. The inner membrane creates two compartments, which you can see, the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. As we'll learn in a later chapter, some metabolic steps of cellular respiration are catalyzed in the mitochondrial matrix. The inner membranes that make the cristae create a lot of surface area for enzymes that make ATP. And of course, ATP is the energy molecule of the body, so it is important that mitochondria can make a lot of it. The chloroplast captures light energy from the sun for plants and algae to build carbohydrates and other macromolecules via photosynthesis. Chloroplasts contain the green pigment chlorophyll, as well as enzymes and other molecules that function in photosynthesis. Chloroplasts are found in leaves and other green organs of plants and algae. Chloroplast structure 
includes the thylakoids, which are the membranous sacs pictured here. And when thylakoids are stacked, they form a granum. The internal fluid of the cell is called the stroma. You'll also notice that like the mitochondria, the chloroplast is surrounded by a double membrane. The chloroplast is one of a group of plant organelles that are called plastids. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have very interesting evolutionary origins. Have you ever considered how cells transition from being prokaryotes to organelle containing eukaryotes all those billions of years ago? Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts have given clues as to how this happened as they have distinct similarities with bacteria. First, they are enveloped by a double membrane. Second, they contain free ribosomes and circular DNA molecules. So your cells contain DNA in the nucleus as well as your mitochondria. On this slide, you can see the circular DNA plasmids for mitochondria and chloroplasts, and you'll notice that they don't carry many genes, mostly the genes that are required for cellular respiration and photosynthesis, respectively. And third, both of these organelles grow and reproduce somewhat independently within cells. And these similarities led to the endosymbiont theory to explain their evolutionary origins. The endosymbiont theory suggests that an early ancestor of eukaryotes engulfed an oxygen-using, non-photosynthetic, prokaryotic cell. This is shown in step three here. The engulfed cell formed a relationship with the host cell, becoming an endosymbiont. Endosymbiont means cell living inside another cell with a mutual benefit for both. This type of relationship is called a symbiotic relationship. You can contrast this with a parasitic relationship where the parasite lives off of a host, harming it and possibly causing death. So those endosymbionts eventually evolved into mitochondria and are the ancestor cells of animals, fungi, and other heterotrophs. At least one of these cells may have later taken up a photosynthetic prokaryote, which evolved into a chloroplast. And these cells are the ancestors of plants and algae because they contain both mitochondria and chloroplasts. The final organelle we'll cover is the peroxisome. Peroxisomes specialize in oxidation. We are going to see the word oxidation used when discussing biochemistry in a later lecture. For now, I'll say that oxidation is either something gaining an oxygen or losing electrons. So we often use this to describe a macromolecule that's being broken apart. Peroxisomes are specialized metabolic compartments bounded by a single membrane. And what they do is add oxygen to a molecule, which is shown in the reaction as RH2, and they produce hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, as a product, which is toxic to cells. The peroxisome then converts the hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, to water, H2O, and also releases oxygen gas. This reaction is important in liver and kidney cells where peroxisomes detoxify substances that enter the blood, such as ethanol, ethyl alcohol. And peroxisomes perform reactions with many different functions. One notable enzyme that are in peroxisomes is catalase, the enzyme that is responsible for the bubbling reaction when you pour hydrogen peroxide from the brown bottle onto an open wound. You'll notice that there's bubbling. That's a release of oxygen gas 
as the hydrogen peroxide is catalyzed into water and oxygen gas by the catalase. Now how peroxisomes are related to other organelles is still unknown. Now we'll move on to the components of the cell that give it support and movement, the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is a network of fibers that organizes structures and activities within your cells. It is composed of three types of fibers that you must know, microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. We'll start with microtubules. Microtubules are the thickest of the three fibers of the cytoskeleton. They are hollow rods that are about 25 nanometers in diameter, constructed of dimers of tubulin. In the last lecture, you learned about monomers, which are single repeating units, while well, dimers are two repeating units. We see the alpha and beta tubulin units in green and pink. I find this one easy to remember because microtubules are hollow tubes made of tubulin, all right? There are a number of important functions of microtubules. The first is shaping the cell, but pretty much all three of the cytoskeleton fibers have a role in cell shape. Microtubules also guide movement of organelles, separate chromosomes during cell division, and aid in cell motility as they are what compose cilia and flagella. And we're going to take a closer look into these last three functions. As mentioned, microtubules play a key role in guiding movement of organelles through a cell, and they do this with the help of motor proteins. Just imagine how much movement there is within your cells where billions of macromolecules, enzymes, and chemical reactions occur. Your cells are highly orchestrated operations, so things aren't simply free-floating, as this wouldn't be very efficient. The microtubules here, seen in pink and green, act as molecular highways for the motor proteins to travel on. The motor proteins shown in yellow are called dynein, and it has two feet that walk along the tracks of the microtubule fibers to carry the cargo. One foot of the dynein maintains contact while the other releases and reattaches one step farther along. So in this way, the dynein is said to walk across the microtubule fiber. Movement requires energy, so of course this process utilizes ATP, which is pictured here. Next is cell motility, which means the ability of an organism to move. Microtubules make up cilia and flagella. Cilia are slender projections, and flagella are longer whip-like appendages that protrude from the cell. These are found on both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and they're often used to propel a cell through water. To accomplish this, Microtubules control the beating of flagella and cilia. In the image, you can see that flagella create a propeller-like motion while cilia beat back and forth. Cilia and flagella actually share a common structure. The EM image shows the microscopic structure. Each of those tiny rings is a cross-section of a microtubule. So this is called a 9 plus 2 axoneme because there are nine doubles forming a ring and two inside. Nine doublets and two inside. This group of microtubules is then sheathed by an extension of the plasma membrane. A basal body, which is shown in the image, anchors these organelles and the motor protein dynein, which we just saw, drives the action. And again, this would use ATP for energy. Finally, microtubules separate chromosomes during cell division. 
They do this via centrosomes and centrioles. Centrosome means center body and serves as the microtubule organizing center in animal cells. Centrosomes are composed of two centrioles arranged at right angles to each other, which are surrounded by a mass of protein. The centrioles are those cylindrical organelles shown in yellow, each with nine triplets of microtubules arranged in a ring. In animal cells, microtubules grow out from a centrosome near the nucleus. The main function for those centrioles is to produce the aster and the spindles during cell division, which we'll learn more about in a later lecture. The next cytoskeleton fiber is the microfilaments, also called actin filaments, which are the thinnest of the components of the cytoskeleton. Microfilaments are solid rods that are about seven nanometers in diameter, and they're built as a twisted double chain of actin subunits as shown here. So notice how it is just a monomer actin repeated in two chains, and those two chains are twisted. A network of microfilaments form a cortex just inside of our plasma membranes, and that helps support the cell's shape. For example, if you recall, the cells that line your stomach are called enterocytes, and they have finger-like projections called microvilli that increase the surface area for more absorption. There are bundles of microfilaments that make up the core of those finger-like projections, those microvilli, that help increase uh, strength of that part of the cell. Microfilaments also function in cell motility. Muscle cells contain the protein myosin in addition to actin. This picture shows a sarcomere, which is the unit of muscle contraction in your skeletal muscles. Notice how the actin and the myosin filaments slide along each other when moving from relaxed to contracted. And this sliding movement is what results in our movement. Cells can also crawl along a surface by extending pseudopodia. Pseudopodia means false foot. And when the cell extends its cytoplasm and those microfilaments, this acts like an arm or a foot to help them step toward their target or ingest something. Finally, microfilaments aid in something called cytoplasmic streaming which is a circular flow of the cytoplasm within cells. And this movement is driven by actin and myosin interactions also. This may help to speed up the transport of molecules and organelles around the cell. And if you're looking under the microscope at a plant cell, you, you may be able to actually witness this for yourself. You might be able to see the chloroplasts engaged in cytoplasmic streaming. The last type of cytoskeleton fiber is intermediate filaments, which are fibers with diameters in a middle range. Intermediate filaments range in diameter from 8 to 12 nanometers, so they're larger than microfilaments, but they're still smaller than microtubules. They are more permanent cytoskeleton fixtures than the other two classes and they support cell shape and they fix organelles in place within the cell. They anchor organelles. In this fluorescent image the intermediate filaments are shown in red. An example of this filament is keratin which is a fibrous structural protein in hair, nails, skin that protects them from damage and stress and Keratin is also found in feathers, hooves, and claws. 
we've covered the major organelles and structural components for inside the cell, now we'll move outside the cell to some important extracellular components, namely cell walls, extracellular matrices, and cell junctions. These extracellular components and connections between cells help to coordinate cellular activities. We'll start with cell walls, which are found in plants, but they're also found in prokaryotes. The cell wall is an extracellular structure that distinguishes plant cells from animal cells. Prokaryotes, fungi, and some unicellular eukaryotes also have cell walls. The cell wall is much stronger and sturdier than a fluid plasma membrane is, so it functions to protect the plant cell. It also helps maintain the shape and it prevents excessive uptake of water. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose fibers embedded in other polysaccharides and protein. If you recall from lecture five, cellulose is a polysaccharide that we are not able to digest, so it serves as insoluble fiber in our diets. This is why plant foods like fruits, vegetables, wheats, beans, lentils, and nuts are a good source of dietary fiber. Cellulose is present in their cell walls. Plant cell walls may have multiple layers, as you can see here. The primary cell wall is relatively thin and flexible, and this is where the cellulose and the polysaccharides and proteins are. The middle lamella is the thin layer that would be between primary walls of adjacent cells that are touching each other. And in some cells, there's a secondary cell wall that is between the plasma membrane and the primary cell wall. But make sure that you note that all cells have a plasma membrane, even if there is also a cell wall in addition, as is here with plants. The extracellular matrix is the term for the environment that is outside of your cells. It's that network of proteins and other extracellular macromolecules. Most cells synthesize and secrete materials that are external to the plasma membrane, and these structures are involved in many cellular functions. Animal cells lack cell walls, but they are covered by an elaborate extracellular matrix, which we also call the ECM. The ECM is made up of enzymes and glycoproteins such as collagen, proteoglycans, and fibronectin. The ECM proteins collagen and fibronectin are able to regulate a cell's behavior by communicating with a cell through integrins, which are pictured here. And integrins are receptor proteins in the plasma membrane. When the proteins bind to the integrins, they can facilitate cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and mediate cellular signals such as regulation of the cell cycle and organization of the cytoskeleton components. So not only does the ECM function to hold cells together to form your tissues, it also allows cells within a tissue to communicate. The ECM around a cell can also influence the activity of genes in the nucleus. Finally, we will cover cellular junctions, which provide contact or adhesion between neighboring cells. We'll start with plants. Plasmodesmata are channels that perforate plant cell walls. Through plasmodesmata, Water and small solutes and sometimes proteins and RNA can pass from cell to cell freely. For animals, there are three types of cell junctions that are common in animal epithelial cells. At tight junctions, membranes of neighboring cells are pressed together, preventing any leakage of extracellular fluid. 
Tight junctions are typical in epithelial cells, which line organs such as the bladder, as well as your skin. Notice how the proteins stitch the two cell walls together, holding the cells together and creating a barrier to prevent leaks. So it's important for any of your organelles or any of your organs that contain fluids or water like your bladder or your gastrointestinal tract to have these tight junctions so that the cells and the tissues don't leak. Desmosomes are anchoring junctions that fasten cells together into strong sheets. These junctions are used to hold tissues together that stretch like your skin, your heart, or your muscle, and they prevent those cells from ripping apart. And finally, gap junctions are communication junctions that provide cytoplasmic channels between adjacent cells for direct exchange of various molecules or ions or electrical impulses. They're found in nearly all types of human cells but are especially important in your cardiac muscle because the signal for your heart to contract is passed efficiently through these gap junctions which allows the heart muscle cells to contract in unison which is very important. Thank you.